It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? And, uh, oh, somebody's at the door. Are we expecting anybody? Don't know. Oh, it's Mr. McFeely. <laughs> Mr. McFeely, come in. Speedy delivery. Hello, Brian and Lee. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Just happened to be in the neighborhood. It's a little gray here today. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is in our neighborhood today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is David Newell, who uh, played Mr. McFeely on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> well, I'm uh, it, actually, uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is now on, well, it's on a lot of the PBS stations on the weekend still. But it's on Netflix and Netflix and Amazon, so people can see it anytime they want to now. Son of a gun. So tell your listeners to uh, search it out, because a lot of your listeners who grew up with it, some of the same programs are being repeated and for younger generations. Absolutely. I'd love that. Now, do, do you still get paid? Do you get a residual from that? Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we do. Yes. Every so often we'll, uh, we'll get a yes, because it uh, it's a... Part of AFTRA's agreement, I, I oh, suppose. Great. I guess there's a, a an agreement with the, you know things are so different now because there's podcasts, there's oh yeah streaming, mm-hmm. and I don't think they've figured all out the, out the payments, how to do all of that, cover the musicians, cover. I'm not talking just about our show, but all shows. You know, mm-hmm. there there's some residual payments that need to be paid, but it's I guess it's a it's being slowly worked out. But yes. I still get uh, payments when they're shown. They, I think they buy up uh, rights for a couple of years. And yes. They pay, yes. and then when that runs out, they re-up again. Hopefully they re-up again. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, my goal is to keep the, the neighborhood, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, going for future generations. It, it's too valuable not to be seen. And so I'm glad that Netflix and Amazon can help that cause i agree uh, well, absolutely and that's you know that's the uh you're right amazon a lot of the younger generation they're they're using netflix and amazon and and they watch tv now on their computers and iphones so it is a, a kind of a changed world from the world i grew up in and, and, oh, and, the, and the, in the world when we started the yeah. program too because mm-hmm. now this is our well, we started making the program in 1967, and somewhere it's still being shown on on uh, television or a, ch- a cable or somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, so back, back then, before there was 500 channels to choose from, <laughs> it, it was a destination. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, yep. children and families knew it came on maybe at 10 in the morning again five o'clock in the afternoon so it was a destination now if anybody misses anything mm-hmm. it can be recorded and played back at a later time so it's a different uh, dynamics of watching television or watching or streaming you can you can be now i think they have the possibility in the airplanes to have you can watch streaming in the airplanes. some air, sure. airlines sure. Mm-hmm. have that possibility so it's it's really so different Mm-hmm. Uh, and I like the old way, but I, I can understand the improvement. But what I like about the, the new system is all of these Mr. Rogers neighborhood programs are library, so to speak, and you can go in and watch three or four or stream them and mm-hmm. and what they call binge view it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So, that's right. And I, so I'm glad. And also, I don't know if your listeners know, but there's a college outside of uh, Pittsburgh called St. Vincent's College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, Fred Rogers' hometown, and they have started 
and built a separate building for the archives of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And Fred's uh, career and his writing is called the Fred Rogers Center. And if your listeners are interested, they can just go to Fred Rogers Center and and uh, take a look and see what's available. It's also a education arm of our company, whereas students who go to St. Vincent's, if they're interested in child development or psychiatry or psychology, they can take some classes in specific things through the Fred Rogers Center. So in that respect, we're continuing the legacy, too. Mm -hmm. That's magnificent. And I want to start out with the obvious question. Um, What was Fred Rogers like in person? A wonderful man. He he was, he had, you know, what a lot of people don't really, he had a great sense of humor. Uh, and that comes out, I think, you can see it in some of the puppets, especially King Friday. <laughs> he wrote his own scripts, but in, in he was a, it, the real thing, it wasn't an act, it was Fred. Uh, it, the one you see on television is uh, is almost the same as you meet in person, I think, on television. He speaks a little slower than for, for children's sake, but that's Fred. <laughs> He was a communicator and not an actor or not a singer, but a communicator and knew how to use television to reach uh, families with young children. And he, that was a special art of his. Plus, he wrote his own program. All of the scripts he wrote, and he wrote the music. He did the, puppete- the puppeteers, and he did the voices. So it was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Indeed. Maybe to answer your question and just let your viewers and your listeners know mm-hmm. well, he was a, a fine man uh, 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 well, could, why, why why did he start the show did he have a well he started in 1954 with a program called the children's corner and he wanted to get into television this is the television he left NBC he was working at NBC on the floor crew in the early mm-hmm. 50s Mm. And he was on his way to be a director or producer, and he told his bosses that he wanted to leave and go to Pittsburgh, where they're starting the first public television station. In fact, that was the fall of 53. And he left that and and became the program manager of the first public station, which was WQED in Pittsburgh. And from that, no one wanted to do a children's program, so he thought he would start one, and he did and the Children's Corner ran for seven years and evolved into Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But he saw television, even in the 50s, and the children's programming was not too good. People were stringing up old slapstick comedies and interrupting mm-hmm. with a toy commercial or something like that. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with slapstick comedies, but not as a steady diet for children. He thought, we can do better than that. So he created uh, a program that he felt is age appropriate for very young children, and his background is in the theology and in child development and music and all those elements he took and put it into Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and it was a, uh, I think he, he was before his time taking a lot of subjects that children uh, maybe deal with as they grow up. You know, going to school for the first time, people don't think about, there's a lot of preparation that a child could use before they go off to school, kindergarten, and then about sibling rivalry and things that you don't really think about. You know about them, but you don't tend to deal with them, and Fred did on television, and it was very helpful to parents with young children and the children themselves. So all of that is to answer your question is that's why he went into television. He wanted to yeah. really help children. He cared more about children and families he does about television or being a on television. That was never his goal. He didn't he in fact he never liked the fame that it brought him. You know, he could go anywhere without people knowing it was Mr. Rogers. That's not what he enjoyed. He enjoyed the creation and the uh, stimulation that his writings and his studies provided families. That was his goal. It's, it's, it's uh, interesting on the way over, I asked Brian, you know, what was it about the show that uh, 
he that that attracted him to the show, and and why did he like the show? And Brian. And my answer was, uh, it was actually a character, or even just a regular person talking to you. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, he saw himself as a communicator, and uh, and that doesn't happen much anymore. In fact, it didn't happen that much then. That's true. Uh, there were very few people on television, especially for children, talking to them about their feelings and what they might be going through at that time. And I think he, he well, he, he, you reacted in the way that Fred wanted you to react, to, to be able to, to listen to some, if you care to. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing saying that you had to stay in front of that TV set, but there, it must have been something he was saying and doing and the way he was saying and doing it that kept you in front of the set. And that's what he hoped. He, he realized that not everybody is going to like or watch the program. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, even today, not all of us like the same programs, but he said, I hope the families who like it can use it. And that was, he was very realistic. But it's television right. is here to stay. And the interesting thing is, shortly before uh, he died, the he wanted to get into... Uh, He got into the early age of television back in the 50s, and that's when he created the Children's Quarter. But as we got into the 2003, 2004, those those years, the computer and the streaming was was coming into its own. And Fred thought, I'd like to get into that somehow, create some product for the computer and make Mm. a very narrow streamed, you know, mm-hmm. maybe uh, design uh, bedtime stories for children that parents could play of Fred reading a bedtime story or a nursery rhyme or something for that age group. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was experimenting with that. He loves radio. He loved it. That was his favorite thing is radio, just what you guys are doing. He would have loved to have had a radio show, and that was something that he was thinking about, too. Just having an hour just to talk to somebody yep. Yep. about without having to uh, watch the clock every five minutes for a commercial or mm-hmm. just have a very relaxing, informative chat with someone. That was what he was interested in. Unfortunately, he had uh, stomach cancer, and that uh, really the last year of his life, he was dealing with that. And it uh, it won, uh, but the last thing I'm uh, you interrupt me for questions if you want, but I'm just keep thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but the last yeah. thing that we did, it was the uh, New Year's Day of 2003. He was the Grand Marshal of the Rose Bowl Parade, mm. and he wasn't feeling very well. And then after the parade, he had to go to the football game and toss the you know, the coin or the nickel or the quarter, whatever they throw mm-hmm. up, you know, the heads or sure, tails. Sure, exactly. And it was a tough day for him, but he got through it, and that was really the last public appearance that he could wow. do. And after that, he had to uh, enter the hospital for some uh, tests, and they discovered, yes, they did the operation, and they thought they got it, but no such luck. It, I guess a couple of weeks later, it really, it, it, he, he just went downhill. But it was, yeah. he was a wonderful, go way back to your question, he was a yeah. wonderful man to work for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, after all, I, I couldn't have had a, a happier career, and still do, really. Yeah. I'm still doing McFeely appearances, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm trying to put a book together about my years working with Fred Rogers. So I've, I've got to a lot to a lot to accomplish. Yes. Yeah, I'd love to uh, see that book when it comes out. I would too. Help you can help me write it. <laughs> <laughs> so also, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, how did you get the uh, part of Mr. McFeely? Well, this is in the summer of 1967, before you were born, right? Mm-hmm. And I was in Europe, in London to be exact, visiting my cousin and a mutual friend of Fred Rogers and mine. Sent me a telegram. There were no. Uh, telephones or computers then, uh, cell phones or computers. Yeah. So I got a telegram and went to the American Express where you got your messages. And to make a long story short, it said Fred Rogers is taking the regional version of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and expanding it to a national 
uh, distribution. And he's enlarging the staff, and my friend said, and I've made an appointment for you with Fred Rogers. I didn't know Fred. I knew who he was, but I didn't know, know him. So I came back to the States, back to Pittsburgh to be exact, and on the day that I my point was set up for, I met Fred and spent an hour with him. He had already talked to other people. And right then and there, after about an hour, he hired me. Wow. And uh, uh, I said, oh, this is wonderful. And I was on my way back to Los Angeles, where I was living for a little bit. I was going to go back after I came back through Pittsburgh. And here I am, <laughs> I'm still in Pittsburgh. Uh, and I loved every minute of working with Fred and learned so much and met so many wonderful people and good friendships and Fred was a, a good friend and he was a good friend he had so many friends he was truly a kind man very smart uh, and it was a pleasure to work for him did, did you think at the time he hired you that you were going to stay there as long as, as long as you had it, did I think of that at the beginning did you say yes mm -hmm. yes uh, you know no that's a good question because I, at some point I was looking around. In fact, we were in Los Angeles after about six years of the program. I said, you know, here we are in Los Angeles. We were taping something. And I said, you know, I, I'm going to test the waters to see if anything is out there that I may be interested in. And I, the rest of the crew came back to Pittsburgh, and I had a few days off. So I stayed for a couple of days and made some appointments. And it came to me. I said, you know... What am I doing this for? I love my job uh, with the neighborhood, and I, and I think then and there I decided. Well, you know, I want to stay with this as long as I can. And I thought, well, maybe another ten years. It turned out to be another thirty years, <laughs> or something like that. So, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. At the moment, going into the job, I didn't think. Well, I'll take this for a year, then I'll move on. But. On the other hand, when you're into a job for a while, you say, well, let me explore. You know, people do that. But then I came to the realization, no, I like what I'm doing, and I feel I'm a intricate part of this operation, and I it's very rewarding emotionally for me, and so here I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have a question from uh, listener Michael Tiller in uh, Atlanta. Michael, thank you for sending in this question. Uh, do you still have your uh, suit from when you uh, wore it on the show? Oh, yes. In fact, I just used it this time last week. I was in uh, a festival outside of Pittsburgh, uh, an arts festival. And the, the weekend before that, I was at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum in Washington, PA. They had a, a, a huge collection of trolleys, I mean, real trolleys. Mm -hmm. And they had Mr. McFeely's parade of trolleys. And people came to see the trolley parade, and we narrated it and so yes i do and i have in fact i have the first uniform that i wore the first taping and that jacket was a dark blue more of a navy blue than mm -hmm. post office blue and the second year i think i got a a lighter blue and then i had some made uh, so i have about 10 uniforms that i started with and have kept over the years and there are two right now that i for the last five years that I've been alternating. One day I'll wear one, and the next day I'll wear a, a different one to keep the wear even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. But, but also, this Tuesday in Pittsburgh, where we taped the program and where I live, uh, the Kaneki Museum is having an art class uh, uh, for, for adults, an evening session. And they invited me to be a model of a Pittsburgh icon. Uh, so wow. they could draw pictures of Mr. McFeely oh, wow. in my uniform. Uh, so I still do a lot of different things, and I do speaking. If any of you, your listeners, ever want a speaker talking about the neighborhood, I they can contact me. I do a lot of that. So it's it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, life uh, being associated with Fred Rogers and all of his ideas and works and programming. You bet. Where does speedy delivery come from? Well... You know, I think it came from the first taping we did, the very first show. Uh, I delivered an animal. It was oh, that's what it was. It was an armadillo, which is a South American. The show children various animals that worked into the script of the show somehow. 
I can't remember the exact uh, the exact reason we had armadillo, but we did. And I remember leaving. Fred showed the audience. We talked about it a little bit. And I said, well, I've got other deliveries, Mr. Rogers, and see you around the neighborhood and speedy delivery to you. <laughs> and he said, speedy delivery, Mr. McFeely, and sort of just stuck. Yeah. And, and then the 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 one-person delivery company became the speedy delivery company, I guess. <laughs> and so, and now it's become not only the company, but it's almost like saying shalom, you know, shalom, yeah. Yeah. Means hello, goodbye, how are you, or uh, aloha, something yeah. like that. And speedy delivery, I all, when I see somebody and I'm Leo, well, speedy delivery to you. <laughs> so I'm using it sort of as a greeting, too. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people have picked up on that. I hear more people have told me at these appearances that uh, their son or daughter or somebody in their family will bring them the newspaper or something and they'll say speedy delivery so i guess this works itself into the culture somehow oh i guess after 40 years it was bound to i think so <laughs> what was the uh, shooting schedule like because obviously you didn't um uh shoot all the house scenes or did you shoot all the house scenes and then shoot all the neighborhood of make-believe scenes well in a reverse order yes we did in a way we worked for the inside out and that is we'd have the script We'd have a week of scripts or two weeks of scripts. That's basically, it's two weeks of scripts we had. So what we would do was go through the scripts, and if there were any locations, like visiting a factory to show how crayons are made, or visiting another factory, we would do all of those first. They would be done. Mm -hmm. So we would know how much time that would be. That Say that's five minutes. Mm -hmm. Then we would do the neighborhood of make-believe, we would set the setup of neighbor to make believe in the studio. It's a big studio that took up a lot of room. So you couldn't just take it down every night. You had to do make make it useful. So mm -hmm. we did about two weeks of neighborhood of make believes which consist of about fourteen programs, something like that. Fourteen mm -hmm. segments. Right. So they would be done. Then they would strike the set and bring in the interior and we would do the wraparounds of those programs. We did the the neighborhoods for does that make mm -hmm. sense to you so yes. in other words we started from the inside out mm -hmm. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the intros and the exits were the last thing we did <laughs> yes <laughs> because we knew how much time we would have then. Mm -hmm. you know if the neighborhood of make-believe happened to be 15 minutes and the uh, location mm -hmm. uh, piece was five minutes we knew we only had 10 minutes for the opening and closing that type of thing. So it was much easier to do it that way. Once, we only did one program, this is sort of a trivia, one Mr. Rogers program all the way through from opening to closing, stopping for each um, segment. Mm -hmm. It's the time that Marcel Marceau, the mime, are you familiar with Marcel Marceau? Yes, I am. He came through Pittsburgh and we wanted to have him on the program. And he only had one day he had a performance in the evening and the next day he was going to Philly I believe and this was going back oh, 20 years uh, so we started with the opening and Marcel Marceau came in in his street clothes he didn't have his mime makeup on and met the children and read his book he spoke then then we went to the make neighborhood of make believe but in the meantime he was able to get into his white face mime cost to mm -hmm. and then we tape the next segment and then that was that but at the beginning we in a way I'll, I'll correct a little bit since he was in his street clothes or his everyday clothes we did the opening and closing so we didn't have to change twice yeah and we did the the uh, neighborhood of make believe as pip that's his character the when he was in his mime costume. Mm -hmm. But we did that all within, I'd say, two hours. And that's the only one that was completed ever of a Mr. Rogers mm -hmm. program within a two hour period. Wow. And if you ever see it on the reruns, the Marcel Marceau visit, you, you, can, you can know that little bit of trivia. Wow. <laughs> Now, you mentioned uh, the uh, parts where you would go to a factory to see how things were made. Uh, that, that was uh, one of my uh, personal favorite parts. 
Uh, it just seemed uh, really interesting to see how uh, things were being made. Yes, we did. A, oh, we did about 300 of those over the years, or maybe more. They ranged everywhere. No, since you said that, what is the one you remember? What's the one you remember the most? Do you uh, remember? The one I remember the most, uh, probably from uh, recent um, boning up for this uh, interview, I saw one of you uh, in a trumpet factory. Oh yes, and I okay, thought that was yes. that, that was really interesting. <laughs> and and uh, sometimes I would go to the factories, and then sometimes Fred would go to the factories. But most of the time, the producers and the camera people went to the factories, and then they would put together the process, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then Fred and I would watch that, and out of that we we would do a. Of dialogue, we would mm -hmm. write our dialogue down and then re record it to right. record the audio. Mm -hmm. So we watch what the editor put together, editing it down to about three, four, five minutes, and then I would do the commentary. Is it's as if McFeely was at the factory? I'd bring <laughs> it over and say, "Mr. Ray Rogers, I was just at the trumpet factory, and <laughs> here's how trumpets are made." Then I'd narrate it, and he'd ask questions. Mm -hmm. But we'd have that written out because we wanted to make sure that the children understood the process. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. But I love those two. I, I, I it was my favorite mm -hmm. thing to do is visit the factories because it's fascinating. Yeah. Is there one that sticks in your mind as your favorite? Oh, boy, I have a lot. That from the trumpet one was, I like the crayon factory. We also went to a place, and I think it was in eastern Pennsylvania somewhere. There's a, they make a, uh, construction paper, you know, the, mm -hmm. the color paper, yeah. and that was fascinating to see the process because, as you probably know, the construction paper goes from a white paper to maybe a green, da 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 mm -hmm. and slowly to black. Right. So it was interesting to see, and I never thought of it, but when they make a, a packet of construction paper, uh, they start from the from the lightest color, maybe light yellow or white, and work all the way down to dark brown and black, because they they don't have to clean the vats each time. Because if you if you put a darker color into white, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just explaining it in a probably yeah. not a very good way, but I think you get the idea. No, I do get the idea. Is you <laughs> go with the light colors to dark colors. So yeah, that right. You don't... That, you're, that, I could have said that much easier. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're right. And that that was a favorite of mine, to watch the process. Oh, and there were so many. Mm -hmm. I, oh, we went to uh, Harmonica Factory, too. Oh, yeah, that was another one that was good. And uh, you know, it, it, this will probably be of interest to you because it was called the Krat. K-R-A-T-T, -T, Harmonica Company. Mm -hmm. And if you think, it's the same company, the father of the Kratz Brothers of, of public television. You know the Kratz mm. yeah. on television, public television? Yes. The Kratz Brothers, mm -hmm. they have a, a show on television, on public television. And it was their family that owned that uh, mm. that company, the Kratz Brothers. And, mm -hmm. I, and are you familiar with that, that show? I don't believe I am. Are you that, late? That was, no. That was before, that was after your time of watching. You came along probably when you had grown out of... Uh, yeah, I, when I graduated. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure there are listeners who know the Kraft Brothers, mm -hmm. uh, and, but that was uh, their father's factory. Mm -hmm. There were two brothers who do... Uh, 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 it's a combination of, a, and of animation and live characters and they introduce animals and respect for animals mm -hmm. and children. A very mm -hmm. good program. But for a little older child, mm -hmm. I think. But we went yeah. to the harmonica factory and the crayon factory and the, uh, then we went to Vermont to see a uh, marble, a marble, not, well, we did both. We did a marble sculptor to mm -hmm. watch a sculptor putting together uh, sculpting out of marble. Then we went to a marble factory to see how marbles that you play with. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's so many. That's you know, right. I, I would like to do a program. It would be fun to do a program uh, calling it Mr. McFeely's How Things Are Made and maybe take three segments mm -hmm. and intersperse them and have a, for instance, the trumpet factory. Do you saw it would be fun to do a trumpet 
a guitar and maybe a piano. In fact, we did all three of those. We went to the Steinway Piano Company in, somewhere in, in New Jersey, I believe, and uh, we did a guitar and we did the, the mm. trumpet. Mm -hmm. All different uh, instrument companies. Wow. And that'd be fun to take a subject and make it uh, a program. Yeah. Know, but. Yeah. Well, we, um, Lee and I are starting up a production company, so if you want uh, any ideas, just give us a call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, well, uh, if you want to do the Mr. McFeely, help things, people make things, let me know. You okay. bet. We'll do. Uh, All right. right. I have a... Uh, I don't mean to cough on the phone, but excuse me one second. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Okay. Go ahead, Lee. How... Uh, how do you think uh, children have changed uh, over the years? How children have changed? Yes. Or how program children's television? Well, not not, uh, not so much children's television, but uh, uh, how, well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this way: Do you, do you think that children have changed? I, you know, <coughs> excuse me. I don't think children have changed that much. I think the outside stimuluses have changed. Ah. You know, like uh, the, the programs may be faster and and um, and the every the everyday life is faster and the the computers coming on us and, and cell phones and all of that stimulus. But I don't think children have changed that much. <coughs> Excuse me. Sure. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, you, you still learn to walk and talk at the same pace. It's developmentally, and, and children learn their language about the same time. If you're, in, you're learning English, if you're learning French or German or whatever, you're learning it about the same time, whatever language you learn to speak. And I don't think that has changed. I think their outside stimuluses have changed. It's coming at kids, and I think they have to be, it has to be monitored by parents and grown-ups, but Children still have the same needs, I, I believe. They still need to be reassured and, uh, and show, show that people care for them. None of that has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is still valid today as it was when you were growing up, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's my sort of, that's my take on it. I've, <laughs> It's not scientific, but that's my yeah. my interpretation, anyhow. Yeah. That's a great answer. It is. You still there? Yeah. Oh, hello? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, one thing I've always wondered when I was growing up is, uh, how come there was never a uh, model set of the neighborhood of make-believe? I would have loved to have uh, played well, with one of those. Well, in a way there was, if you remember. Yeah, that's a good question, but... The trans they were considered transitions, but remember in the kitchen, mm -hmm. he would have little models of the neighborhood of make believe. Remember, he'd go yep. to the shelf and say, let's go, let's, I remember exactly, he said, let's, today, and he would take the tree off the mm -hmm. shelf. Yep. Let's pretend that Mr. McFeely is delivering something to X the Owl mm -hmm. and, uh, today, and then the camera would come in to mm -hmm. small model, and then neighborhood of make-believe would start and there'd be mr mcfeely driving up to the the tree in that respect we mm -hmm. had models but you're talking about the overview mm -hmm. right as exactly because as soon as i i think the first time i saw those models on the shelf and i saw them using them like i i gotta have a set of that <laughs> did you ever get them of, you know we've had a lot of photos over the years of families whose children made the neighborhood you know some were sophisticated, some were just old shoe boxes and yeah. things like that. And that's exactly what Fred encouraged. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he never wanted children to go out and buy fancy toys or parents buy fancy toys. He said, you know, yeah. they get as much pleasure out of the box the toy came in it's as true. the toy itself. You know, I don't know if you have any children, but I remember our kids, when they get a fancy toy, they'd open it and play with it for a little bit, and then they'd make something out of the box. Mm -hmm. That's what they like. It's true. Uh, it, it, it's it, in, in, in Fred used television to encourage creativity and encourage mm -hmm. communications. In fact, our company was called Family Communications Incorporated. It was it was Fred's ideal was that children would see something on Mister Rogers' neighborhood and then 
television would be turned off and maybe the family would would have a chance to discuss something. In other words, family communications. That's right. Now, that's an ideal. It doesn't happen. But Fred, you know, tried for that. Mm-hmm. Our company is now called the Fred Rogers Company. Oh. Uh-huh. And it's, Fred never wanted it to, to, to be called during his lifetime. He he didn't want that to be the Fred Rogers Company, but his, but his family okayed it, and now it's called the Fred Rogers Company. And we have an new program, which you probably realize, uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which mm-hmm. is animated. And then there's two other programs we've acquired. One is called The Odd Squad, and another is called PEG, P-E-G plus CAT. And mm. they're both programs dealing with math for different age child. The PEG is for younger, and Odd Squad is for an older. But they're nothing to do with Mr. Rogers yeah. other than we follow them through as producers through our our company, and we do a lot of the outreach, the follow up uh, for the programs. So we we have a and Daniel Tiger, by the way, is in twenty five countries now. Oh, really? Yeah, around the around it's in Germany and in Australia and and Switzerland and Sweden, just to name a few. So it's. Uh, Fred's legacy started with this little program called the Children's Corner in mm-hmm. 1954. Very basic program, and, and Daniel Tiger was the first one on it. Mm. First puppet that made the appearance in the Children's Corner in 1954 has now has his own program around <laughs> that goes around the world. That's probably why he was my favorite. I don't know why, but uh, you know Daniel was always my favorite. <coughs> Daniel was. Yeah. So when uh, I. Our, our listeners don't know this, but I met you at um, the Philadelphia Comic Con for a photo op, and you took out uh, Daniel Tiger. I said, uh, I think I was the one who said, could I uh, wear it for the shot? And you did, didn't you? I did, yes. Yes, uh, that was, the, I've, I've done what other Comic Con since I met you, and that was in uh, Canada. Mm-hmm. And I, talk, I took Daniel with me, and a lot of the people remember Daniel because Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, before it was in the United States, it was in Canada. It started on the CBC. Mm. And it's it's it, it's still on, on certain times. Mm-hmm. But Daniel Tiger is in Canada now, too. So they knew Daniel from even before mm-hmm. the United States. That's right. But it's a it's, it's been such a wonderful experience these comic cons because as as you know you got a, mainly you get adults who come to them who who have grown up with the various programs uh, but kids were there too but I'm mm-hmm. saying that your age group came because they remembered that's right various programs that they liked when they were growing up and it's fascinating to talk to people uh, uh, about their experiences like I didn't know that you know your favorite was Daniel it's mm-hmm. so interesting to find out people meet people and find out what what and you're, you're telling me you like the uh, the visits to the factory it's fascinating mm-hmm. and it's helpful too when we were in the throes of production we would do a little research mm-hmm. nothing scientific but research like that anecdotal i guess you'd call it yeah and to find out what interests people and that's interesting if you know daniel and and the uh, the factories that would be something that I'd go back to a meeting and say well listen I met a, a person who likes that and you know if, if that one person likes Daniel in the factories I bet there are another 5,000 people who do too yeah. <laughs> so let's do that's something right. based on that anyhow that's so, anecdotal it's not scientific yeah. but you know what I mean yeah <laughs> but anyway um, you're saying that uh, Fred wrote all the songs uh, what was your favorite song from uh, all the oh. years you know, other than Won't You Be My Neighbor, he, he wrote a song, which is a lovely song, called Children Can. I don't know if you know that one. It's a lovely, mm-hmm. uh, very uh, sweet, about uh, the, the basic message is that children, you can crawl under a table. Children can do many things. Even mm-hmm. though you're not an adult, you can still crawl under a table. And it's a, a song and a message to children about growing up and growing mm-hmm. up in a very positive way. And it's a beautiful song. It's called Children Can. And it's probably on, uh, it's on albums I know that are mm-hmm. available. And 
I think it's on the YouTube. You know, there are That's Mr. Right. Rogers songs on YouTube or iPod or whatever it is. That's <laughs> right. That you can listen to. My uh, personal favorite was uh, "You You've Got to Do It." Uh, I so, think it was that was the um, one song that I think pushed me through college. You know. I, but it, 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 that's very interesting you would say that. I was going to say that next because there's a message to that. <clears throat> and I did push you through college. But, you know, <clears throat> children always, Fred would always say to children you know, that you don't, it's not magic. You don't learn to play the piano or ride a bike by just picking up a bike and getting on it. It takes a lot of practice. You don't sit down to play the piano and play a concerto the first time you sit at the piano. It takes years and years and years and years of practice. And that's what Fred wanted to establish with some of these songs. The messages that were in them mm -hmm. was uh, very important uh, to Fred. But he used music to get those messages across. And that came comes from his music training. But also with that music training came uh, the child development, too. That mm -hmm. he, he, you can see how he tied all that together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I called it Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood Program almost like a symphony, whereas there's the opening where Fred comes in, and, he, and I'm symphony, I'm not a music scholar, but I sense that they introduce the main theme in a symphony and then the neighborhood of make-believe which could be so th then there's variations on that theme uh in the second movement i guess and then mm -hmm. then in the final movement fred comes back to the his house and signs off and that's mm -hmm. what the a symphony does too and i guess fred being a musician maybe he designed it that way i i something i never did ask but i Again, that's all my theory, mm -hmm. but I think there's something to it. What, what did you or, or, or Fred Rogers think of uh, the uh, Saturday Night Live parody? <laughs> well, you know, that's funny because uh, after the first episode of the Eddie Murphy Saturday Night Live, uh, or maybe the second, I saw it. I don't know, Fred never did see it, uh, but after the first couple episodes, they became so popular that I would get calls from the producer of Saturday Night Live asking me if Fred, if I could get Fred to come on to Saturday Night Live oh my and goodness. surprise Eddie Murphy after one of those skits. Or in the middle of a skit, what they wanted Fred Rogers to do during one of the skits was be, there. Eddie would start the skit and there would be a knock at the door mm -hmm. and they think, would think it was part of the skit and there would be Fred. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted to do. And uh, so we went up to meet them twice. We we were in New York and we met with them twice. I, you know, Fred was not a, an actor. He didn't have an actor's uh, bag of tricks, you know, to do anything on. That was just not who he was. And I don't think he felt that comfortable doing it, uh, mm -hmm. but I think it would have worked. But Fred always thought he people when people have asked him about those skits, he always said that he thought that they were affectionate. They could be a little raunchy. Oh <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. But, but Fred thought that he, they were not mean spirited. No, no, no. I, I I always took it as a tribute to to the show. You know. oh, oh, I, I, yeah. Oh, I think you're right. I mm -hmm. think that you don't spoof something that you yes. don't know about. That's true. And I think that that you're right it, it was a tribute to him and I think that was the the sense uh, and also Fred is a perfect it's a perfect program to spoof in a way you know it's it's too tempting not to do it and then Eddie Murphy is a comedian it's a sure. perfect fodder for a comedian <laughs> but I think he was doing it in a respectful way and not mean spirited there have been some mean over the years, but yeah. that wasn't one of them. And Fred, Fred saw that. He just wasn't comfortable being in a skit on Saturday Night Live. That's not something he, I think, wanted to do. But they were very popular skits, and you know, I still hear from people who say, "Oh, I remember the time that Eddie Murphy." And they must have done oh twenty or thirty. Oh, the sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the seasons. That's right. But now, due, due to uh, the recent uh, violence that's been going around the country, 
Uh, do you think that uh, one of the uh, special episodes should be re-shown either on television or on the Internet? The, the, the violence, you say? Yeah, I think there was a special program made uh, in the so, early 80s. Yeah, we have done, I think they showed, uh, Fred during 9-11 made some PSAs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they'll still show them from time to time. They'll pull them out in the basic message in those PSAs was uh, look for the helpers. You know, there's not much you can do. What could any of us do during 9-11? Not much. Mm -hmm. Except just be horrified. However, when children see some of that, what you could tell children when they, they're not going to miss it. They're going to know something's going on. Mm -hmm. Fred's advice was to parents and caregivers to say to children, Look for the helpers, people who are helping those in trouble. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Hope I'm not coughing in your ear, am I? No, 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 no. You're, no. you're fine. You're fine. Did I get that point out? <laughs> yeah, you did. And um, well, one more um, uh, technical question, I guess. Uh, how long does it take you to transform into Mr. McFeely? Oh, about a half hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, the day you met me. I was I was David Newell, and I had the coat and the hat, I believe, with me. Right. Some of the puppets. But just this past weekend, as I was telling you, it was at the Arts Festival, and I got there. I had to begin at uh, 12 o'clock noon, and I got there by 11.30, and by 12 o'clock I was ready to go. So I have it down to a science now, because mm-hmm. I I wear a wig, and I, I had a mustache my own for years and years, and when I don't want to have it, I... I do a, a pretend mustache, <laughs> and I have a pair of glasses that now have my prescriptions in them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it takes me about twenty minutes. Oh, there's a, uh, and maybe you've seen it. There's a documentary out called Speedy Delivery. I have seen it. And, yes, uh, it shows me getting into my costume. Uh, yeah, but a lot of it is uh, time elapsed. So you know, I wasn't sure uh, how long it actually took. Because I mean, obviously, if they're not going to. Uh, spend a full 30 minutes showing you getting ready. No, 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 oh, no, no, no. It, yeah, it was, it was, it, you're right. It was, it was, a, a, yes, it was a process. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but some of that 30 minutes is getting into my boots, which mm-hmm. they don't need to see necessarily. <coughs> but, uh, there, if any of your listeners are interested in the Speedy Delivery documentary, uh, they can go to speedydeliverymovie.com, speedydeliverymovie.com, and they can get a copy of it on on, on that uh, website. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, pardon me. That was one of the uh, best documentaries I, I, on... Uh, well, I, I'm getting over a cold, so... Oh, oh I'm sorry I'm to hear that. Getting my but, cold started up again. But, but am I okay? You can hear me all right? Oh, yes, you're, 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 you're loud and clear. Okay. Do you have any more questions? That yeah. Well, I just wanted to mention that uh, that was one of the best um, documentaries on television that I've ever seen. Oh, what? The, the Speedy Delivery? The Speedy Delivery, yeah. Oh, you saw it? I did see it, yes. Oh, they, they showed it in... in uh... No, actually, I uh, read about it online, and then I went to the website, and I bought up a copy right away. Oh, okay. So it, it's good. Mm-hmm. So, well, it, it was done here in Pittsburgh, and... On location, they follow me to different events. Well, you, you've seen it. Yeah. And But they also interviewed, for your listeners who haven't seen it, they interviewed Fred's wife, Fred Rogers' wife, and, and my wife, and uh, two of my boys. My daughter was out of the country at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, some of my co-workers. And it, it was a, it's a very, I think, the, somebody called it a valentine to... to Mr. McFeely. <laughs> I think so. Uh, and, it's, and I'm so glad that uh, that I have that for for the future and for my for the grandkids. Yeah. To have something to leave to them. You bet. Also, um, this is going to wrap this up. Uh, during that documentary, they t- they showed a Mr. Rogers exhibit. Does that still go around the country? Oh yeah. Well, that, well, here's here's I can fill you in all of that now. Uh, Yes, there's a Daniel Tiger exhibit that's currently in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Mr. Rogers exhibit, after it finished its tour, ended up at the Children's Museum in Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. elements of it, okay. which also has the Daniel T- 